Father God, thank you for your presence with us this morning. Thank you for the way that you've been with us as we've shared together, worshipped together, prayed together, broke bread together, prayed for people together. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you're with us now as we look at your word and ask that you will speak into our hearts and lives this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. I, uh, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 90, please, Psalm 90. While I was in Brazil um, during August, I was in Brazil for the whole of August, uh, involved in a variety of things, but while I was there, I, I took an opportunity for a retreat. Uh, I was in a place called Foz de Guaçu, which is the uh, beautiful uh, waterfalls, 275 separate waterfalls. It's the biggest waterfalls in the entire world. Uh, I was there and I took the opportunity for a retreat and talking to God and listening to God about all sorts of things. And this particular psalm I want to share with you this morning is one that uh, really lived for me during that time and while I was in Brazil. And I've actually shared it in a couple of places since as well. Uh, so what I want to share with you is part testimony it's part challenge for you as well as we look at this psalm together. Whenever we, uh, whenever we read poetry, it's important that we understand what sort of poetry it is. I mean, when you read a limerick, you know, there was a young man from Japan who wrote songs that never did scan. When asked why this was, he said, it's because I always fit as many words into the last line as I possibly can. When you read that sort of limerick, it's a very different thing to when you like that, didn't you? When you, when you uh, are reading a Shakespearean sonnet. So when we come to read the Psalms, the Psalms are poetry. They're originally sung, but they're poetry. And, and they have a, a number of different structures. So we need to understand what it is we're reading. And this particular Psalm is a Psalm of lament. It's one of the commonest forms of Psalms. And the Psalms of lament all are in three parts. And this psalm is in three parts. So the first part of a psalm of lament is a reflection on life. And it, it, the clue is in the name, the psalm of lament. It's a moan. It's a negative reflection on how life is. And this psalm begins with a very powerful moan about life. The final part of the psalm of lament is request to God. The most important part is the bit that goes in between. If you like, it's the filling in the sandwich. It's, it's that bit that is in between that first part and that last part. And it, it's called the pivot, the fulcrum. It's the thing around which the psalm turns. And in this psalm, it's verses 11 and 12. And uh, we'll get to those when we finished verse 10. But that's how the, the psalm is structured. Now, for those of you who have grown up in Europe and went to school in Europe, um, you were trained in, in school, in your scientific thinking, to have a particular understanding. And if you were in a European-style school in another continent, a particular understanding of how the world is. And, and the way that you, you were taught was that this is, this is science here, and this is the physical realm, and this is the real realm. This is where we can look at things and examine things, and this is real, and we can prove it and test it, and, and, and we know it's factual. And, and then over there somewhere, some people believe in a spiritual realm that's not actually very real. It's, it's all a matter of our personal belief and, and choice. And there was no connection in the way that you were taught between that scientific real world and the sort of imaginary spiritual world. Well, when you read a psalm like this, you're in for a shock because this psalm is very clear that those two worlds, they're not just interrelated, they're actually different sides of the same world. There is no separation between that physical and spiritual those realms are in constant interaction and, and, and that's the way that we should see things and 
as we see as we go through the psalm. Now, some of you, it's been a while since I preached here. In fact, we worked out, Philip and I, that it's exactly nine months since I last preached here. So some of you may not have been in one of the sermons that I have done here. So I need to warn you something. You ready? I ask questions. Now, I don't just do what preachers sometimes do and ask questions and then tell you the answer. I ask questions and I expect you to answer. Is that okay? I'm going to do it anyway. That's you. Thank you. You remember well. I'm going to do it anyway. So, uh, and I will wander around with a microphone and I'll be looking for answers. So when I ask a question, if you want to say something, just put your hand up and I will endeavour to come to you with a microphone and you can take part as we explore this psalm together. So I hope it's okay. If it's not, I'm going to do it anyway. So let's begin this, this psalm. We're going to start at verse 1 and we're going to finish at the end of the psalm in a little while. And uh, I, I know that these days here you use the New Living Translation. I'm still using the New International Version. So um, apologies if this is slightly different to the version that you're currently using. Lord, you have been a dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dusk, saying, return to dust. O sons of men. God is eternal. Before the world was brought into being, God was. I had a college day, a campus day yesterday with our new MA course. And um, I'm not going to rehearse any of that material. But we were looking at, in passing, at the writings of a guy called Anthony Flew who, when I did my first degree, was one of the country's leading atheists. He's now become a theist. He believes in God. Why did that change? Because he looked at the universe, and he became convinced that the only rational explanation of the universe is that there is a God who not only created it, but actually is still involved in it. Before the world was brought into being, God was. Throughout human history, God has always been there as a shelter, as a dwelling place for those who recognize him as their Lord. And that speaks into our culture today, where we have a culture or cultures of rootlessness, an environment of constant change, where for many people there is no physical location that is home that has any meaning anymore. I was talking to someone, I, if, if you're here, I don't remember who you were. So, um, it, it's, so I was talking to someone a little while ago and they were saying that um, their parents come from uh, another continent, born here, and, and very much involved in, in the culture of their parents. So here doesn't feel like home. And they'd gone back to visit the town that their parents came from, which their parents talk about as home. And went there, and that wasn't home either, because they don't identify with that. So they're not at home here, they're not at home there. Where is home? For us as Christians, home is being in God's presence, having God as our dwelling place. So what does that mean? Some of you will have that experience. What does that mean for God being your dwelling place? What does it mean to have God for you? This is a testimony time. What does it mean for you to have God as your dwelling place? Would a few people like to tell us that? What does it mean to have God as your home, God as your dwelling place? Nobody here have that experience. That's slightly alarming. Okay. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Having God as my dwelling place means I feel secure in whom I believe and whom who dwells in me. Okay. 
when uh, Doug and I were talking this week about home and going home, and I told him I've always said I'm going home even if it's a hotel if I know he's there waiting for me. It's home. And I think it's the same thing with God. It's moving into his presence is that place that you dwell in, that you, you spend your time and your emotions and your, those things that are valuable to you, where you share your thoughts and, and your ideas. And that's, that's home. And that should be, when we meet God, that should be where we are. Very good. I travel quite a bit, as you know, and I, I uh, sometimes go to countries, cities that I've never been to before. And I was in one recently, and I was talking the day after I'd arrived, and uh, I was sharing about this first part of this psalm. And I said, you know, when I got off the plane here yesterday, I've never been here before. When I got off the plane here yesterday, I was at home. Not at home because this is my city, not at home because you are my family, but at home because God's here already. God is my dwelling place. So I'm at home with all that that stands for, of security, of peace, of being held. God is my dwelling place. You see, in contrast to God, human beings, it says here, come from and return to dust. And, and here that's a direct reference to God's judgment of humankind because of sin. You don't need to turn to it, you can if you want to. I'm just going to read to you Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. It's part of the judgment uh, from God on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since you, from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Our death, and we'll come back to this in a few moments, our death is a result of God's action, of God's judgment. Verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are new like the grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new. By evening it is dry and withered. thousand years in your sight are like a day that's gone by. We, we have a big thing, don't we, in our world, celebrating the new year. And 15 years ago, nearly 16 years ago now, when we celebrated the new millennium, huge parties and celebrations all over the world. But for God, it's just like nothing. What we think is a huge, big time marker to God is nothing, absolutely nothing. This image here from new grass, dry and withered, doesn't actually work in West London. I don't think the grass in my garden has ever got dry and withered. Under water, yes. Dry and withered, no. But the image is from a hot, dry climate, so this is how it works. In the morning... So this is Palestine, Israel. In the morning, the grass is standing up, looking very fresh and green, looking lovely. And then the sun comes up, and the sun beats down on said grass all day. It gets very hot and very dry, and the grass withers. And by the end of the day, it's all limp and laying on the ground. Then it gets cold. And the dew falls. And the dew comes and rests on the grass. And during the night, the grass soaks the dew up. And by the morning, the grass is all standing up and bright and looking fresh and ready for the new day. And then the sun comes out. We do it all again. That's the image that is here. Every morning, the grass is renewed. Every evening, it's withered. This is an image 
of human beings. Forever renewed, but ever fading, ever dying, said Derek Kidner. There is this strange phrase here. Um, verse 5. Look at verse 5. That phrase there, the sleep of death. Anybody like to tell us what they think that might mean, that phrase, the sleep of death? What's that about? Anybody want to say? Have a guess? Have a think? Think aloud with us? See, it just like, you know, we think we people have died, but they're just sleeping because nobody actually dies, you know. We're going to resurrect to one way or the other is it that we're asleep uh, what you say is true but that's not what the psalmist is talking about but um you're on the right track yeah i'm so glad you're here this is the second question you've answered so yeah, you're doing really well i don't know whether it's right but i it could be the long sleep that is death itself it's true but that's not what's here so what this is about is this let me just tell you a, an image, uh, and then we'll see how it applies here. So it's 2 o'clock in the morning. You're in your house. You're fast asleep. A burglar comes. They prise open your back door. They come into your house. They take your TV, your stereo, your whatever else, load it up in their van, and they've gone. You wake up in the morning. You come downstairs. Your back door's open. Half your stuff's gone. Because you were asleep, you couldn't do anything about what was going on around you. The Bible says that human beings naturally are spiritually asleep. They are dead to the reality that's going on around them. And they can go through the whole of life actually being spiritually dead until in a moment, physical death sweeps them away. One person expressed it like this. They said human beings are naturally anesthetized to the transitory nature of life, then suddenly they're swept away. You know how it is, there's a tin can sitting in the gutter, and uh, one of these perhaps drains, not like the nice ones we have in Greenford with covers on, but like in many other countries, you have these open holes, drains, because when it rains, there's so much water, it doesn't go down through the, the little nice tidy grid thing. So the tin can sitting there, and suddenly the heavens open. I remember a little while ago, a few years ago, I was at a funeral in Jamaica. And uh, the lady who I was with said, Pastor, we need to go indoors. I said, why? She said, it's going to rain. Okay, going to rain, so... We're at, we're at a funeral. She, she said, Pastor, we, we really need to go indoors. It's going to rain. So I said, no, that's fine. She said, well, Pastor, I'm going over there indoors. I'll see you when it starts to rain. <laughs> I'd only been in Jamaica a few days. And then suddenly we went from what seemed to me like a nice sunny day. I mean, you couldn't, you, those of you who've been or from the Caribbean, you know what it's like. It's one of those storms where you can't see between the raindrops. I mean, it's just solid water. Um, that just came down. I mean, I, I was soaked within about five seconds. I mean, it just whoosh like this. Took out all the power. I mean, it, it was a big storm. It took out all the, all the power and because the water was so dense, it shorted out all the... Anyway, the image, that water comes and the can is gone. And, and there, there is, it's just unexpected. And death, actually, is always unexpected. Even when someone is ill... We're surprised when they die. But of course, there are many people who were awoke yesterday morning. 
in our world, many people who awoke yesterday morning thinking that they had many years to live if they thought about it. But this morning, they're no longer alive. That's the reality of the world in which we live. That was not how God intended it, but, but that's how it is. Death comes, and it's always unexpected. Are you feeling a bit despondent? It's about to get much worse. Remember, this is, this is a psalm of lament. Okay. Let's take it a stage more. Verse 7. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. These are really sombre verses. The context is God's judgment of sin. Even sins that people think they do in dark corners that people can't see. God sees. It's a reminder that the reason that we die 70, 80 years, that life is so wearisome, it's so difficult. I, I sat this week, I visited someone this week, Christian, been Christian for many years, and uh, first time I had sat with them and, and talked to them and they said, Pastor, this, this week is, in fact, tomorrow, it's the anniversary of my son's death. He was just over 20. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, he killed his girlfriend and then he killed himself. And my daughter found his body just over there. Now that, you might think, well, that's an, that event is an exceptional event to happen, but you sit with so many people, and many of you in the room here, many of you who are watching this on the internet, there will be events in your life that are resonating with this. I mean, not your relatives that have killed themselves. So for some of you, that will be the case. But there will be things that are really painful, really difficult, really very, very hard that have happened in your life. It happens to most people in our world. There are those things, there are those things that make life so hard and difficult. And for many of you now, I'm not going to ask you what they are, so there's no question coming here at the minute. But for many of you, as you're listening to me, there are things just surfacing in your mind. Things that you remember. Really painful events that have happened in your lives and circumstances either to you personally or people, and it's often harder to bear when it's people that are close to you. The reason for all of this, this wearisomeness, this heaviness in life, the reason that life ends in such predictable decline, I still remember not long after I started as a pastor here some 28 years ago, visiting a lady who lived just the other side of the road here. Uh, she was part of the, um, what was then called the Women's Fellowship, so what's now the Afternoon Fellowship here, and sat with her, had a cup of tea with her, and a piece of cake, and she said to me, Pastor, she said, don't ever get old. There is this predictable decline in life. And the reason for all of that, all of that is humankind's sin. This was not God's intention for humanity. When God made, it was good. There was no sickness. There was no disease. In fact, there was no death. Death did not come into the world until Adam and Eve whether you believe in a literal Adam and Eve or whether you 
uh, take it as being a, uh, a metaphor, a picture, uh, at this point makes no difference. But the issue is it wasn't until they ate of the tree, the fruit of the tree, that actually brought death into our world. It was not God's intention. But it is our reality that we live in. A world that is painful, a world that is broken. Every time you listen to the news, there's yet more tragedy. Whether it's on the big scale, like the airliner that crashed yesterday, killing all those tourists on their way home after holiday. Or whether it is a car accident, coach accident. Whether it is something that happens to an individual. Every time you watch or listen to the news, it's full of tragedy. Our, our world is full of it. It's packed with it, isn't it? Side to side. That was not God's intention for us. So all of that lament sets the context for these next two verses and then what follows. So I hope you're feeling somewhat despondent as you look at some of the hardness of life. There is good news coming. In fact, there is good news and then there is amazing news. So we've got the good news first, then after that we've got the amazingly good news coming. Is that right? Still with me? I only had one person leave so far, so we're doing all right. He did tell me he had to go, so he said, don't take it personally. He said, I, I, I need to leave, I've got to be somewhere else. Do you always go on this long? He said, I'm talking about the service this morning, so he was a visitor. So. Um, Verse 11 and 12, key verses. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We live in a world where most people live for the moment. Either happily or unhappily, they live for the moment. They don't recognize their own mortality, the fact that they're going to die. It's not something that most people recognize or think about. And they don't recognize their own sin and the consequences of, of that. Those things that people have done wrong that block their relationship with God. And they don't recognize the connection between the two. Truly wise people recognize how short their lives are. Life is very short. Very short. Truly wise people recognize that. Truly wise people recognize that God judges sin. God judges wrong actions and attitudes. And they live their lives appropriately. And they number their days. I want to spend a few minutes thinking about this phrase, what it means to number our days. I've been a Christian now for over 45 years. My new birthday, so when I was, became a Christian, actually is next week. And I will have been a Christian for 46 years. Yes, I am old. I have no idea how much time God is going to continue to give me in this world. I'm not expecting to die today or tomorrow. But then neither are most of the people who were alive yesterday who are not alive today. So I have no idea how much time I have left on earth. I have eternity with God. I don't know how much time I've got left here. And so I want 
every day to count. I want to number my days. I want to make sure that every day for me, I'm doing what God wants me to do. What God wants me to do with family. You've met some of them, some of you for the first time, others reunited with various of my family here today. So with what I do with my family, with my children, their partners, my grandchildren, I want to make a difference in their lives today, this week, because I don't know about tomorrow and next week. I, I want to make a difference in what I'm doing for God with the people he's put around me. So people that I'm caring for, whether it's as a pastor here, pastor in East London, whether it's the eight, I had a count up the other day, currently eight church leaders who I now meet with and mentor in one capacity or another. Mostly they're pastors, some of them have other roles. Whether it's in the people that I bump into, as I travel backwards and forwards to East London, as I connect with people, as my life rubs up against other people's lives, Christians and non-Christians, I want to be every encounter. I want to be doing what God wants me to do. That doesn't mean that I'm necessarily telling everybody about Jesus all the time, but it does mean that I treat people appropriately and right in every encounter, as God would want me to. I do get things wrong. Okay? I do make mistakes. I have bad days as well. You know, not just Andy has bad days. I have bad days as well. I don't want to portray myself as being perfect. My wife would give you a long list of reasons that I'm not. I'd like you to turn to the person next to you, or three, if you know, if they're that's how it works out. If you don't like the, you heard me say this before, if you don't like the person next to you, now's a really good time to move. <laughs> I, uh, Wendy's about to move. I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you just to spend a couple of minutes, and, and it is literally a couple of minutes, so this is not a time to tell your life story, but actually to reflect what it might mean for you, take a minute each, what it might mean for you to live your life appropriately, to number your days, what that might look like for you tomorrow or today. So we're not talking about something you're working up to in five years' time, you know, or a new year resolution. We're talking about today, tomorrow. What does it look like for you what do you think it might look like for you to number your days? So do that. You've got two minutes. Three, two, one. Shh. If you're part of the leadership team or the ministry network, can you stand? Leadership team, ministry network, please stand. Thank you. Um, the rest of you, you're safe for the moment, so... These people are not, but they're leaders, so that's okay. So what does it mean for you, Steve? You've got two sentences, okay? Ministry Network people, two sentences. That's not two paragraphs. That's two sentences, even if you're an evangelist. What does it mean for you to number your days? No different at all, because our lives should be living that way anyway. Hearing from God. Like there was a second, the mouth was still open. I thought there was a second sentence coming then. So, uh, um. uh, looking for opportunities. Don't put things off till tomorrow. Yeah, hear, hearing your sermon, it makes me think that I'm always somebody who's looking ahead and working out what's God doing, where's He going, where will we be, what's happening. Whereas the challenge is to stay in this moment or the challenge of today or the challenge of tomorrow. Very good. Apologies for if I tread on you as I go past. Don't to do tomorrow what you could do today because you might not have a tomorrow. Very good. 
You can all sit down, by the way. You four can't, so... Two sentences. Yeah, two sentences. Okay, make mine quick. To not um, worry about what other people think, to actually just let do what God wants to be done, to break the mould of what it looks like. Being obedient to what God is asking or saying. Um, to live every day like uh, there's no tomorrow, um, because uh, actually tomorrow never comes, because there will be tomorrow tomorrow. And Have you noticed how he's making one very long sentence <laughs> with multiple uses of the word because? You've got half a sentence left, no more becauses. And... Um, <laughs> One thing I, I, I pray for every morning is that w things that I say, see, do, or think will be that which God wants me to do. Thank you. To reflect Christ in everything I do, because every second is canon, because I don't know what the next second will be. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for volunteering so wonderfully. <laughs> Verse 13. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. Morning was the conventional time for the answer of prayer for God's help and, and it was linked to the, the coming of the dawn in the, in the Middle East. Uh, you go back to this sort of time, there obviously were no street lights, um, so at night it was dark. I mean really dark. Most people who've only lived in London never seen dark. They've just seen light and not quite so dark, not quite so light, a bit more orange, but real dark. And then the other thing in the Middle East is that unlike in the UK when it can take a fortnight for the sun to come up, in the Middle East it's in a moment. So you go straight from darkness to light very, very quickly and the reverse also. And so the idea is that of worshippers uh, spending the night in the darkness and then suddenly there is the light of the new day. It, it is a this is a prayer for reversal of judgment. And it's a prayer that's actually reflected in the New Testament as well. You might want to turn to this, uh, mark it and go back to it later on. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our, remember this is Paul writing and his life wasn't free from grief and difficulty. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. So all this grief and difficulty which we reflected on in the first part of this psalm, there is a reality I'm not in any sense downplaying the reality of all that pain and difficulty. When we put it in the context of the eternal glory, suddenly it looks like light and momentary affliction. Something small and something passing very quickly when we see it in the context of eternal glory. And we fix our eyes not on what we've seen, because everything you can see, brothers and sisters, is temporary. What is most real 
is what you can't see which rather goes against so much of our culture. So that's good news, isn't it? Here next is the most amazing news. Verses 16 and 17. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This is a prayer that God's people, you, me, are not simply going to be, as one writer wrote uh, 120 years ago when writing on this psalm. He was saying, we're not, merely spectators in our world. Our, he wrote, this is Alexander McLaren, our fleeting days are ennobled by being permitted to be God's tools. So our few days that we have, they're made significant because our hands can be the tools of God. And here's the thing, what God does, how long does it last? How long does the stuff that God do last? So if our hands are doing God's stuff, how long does it last? So we have the amazing privilege of being permitted to be tools in God's hand. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of uh, Victorian times, since it is far more his work, God's work, than ours, he will secure it immortality. Our labor is not in vain. So here's the amazing good news in this story. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where there is a lot of pain, a lot of weariness. We live in a world where there's a lot of death. We live in a world where there is inevitable physical decline. Yet we live in a world where our lives can have huge significance. Significance for eternity. If we allow God to work in us and through us. So life is troubled, life is limited. But as we confess God and we serve God, we can make an eternal difference. Another writer, uh, Weisser, he's got this amazing phrase that he uses when writing about this psalm. He said, this psalm is about experiencing the eternity of God in the midst of passing life. To experience the eternity of God in the midst of passing life. And for this to be our reality, we need to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. I'm going to give you just a moment of silence. You may want to say something to God silently. God may want to say something to you. And then I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to make a response to God together. Let's stand together, shall we? Father God, I thank you that you can be our dwelling place. You can be our home, wherever we are, whatever context or situation, whatever physical or social location we find ourselves in. You can be our home, our dwelling place. Thank you that you give us the amazing privilege 
an opportunity of making a difference that counts for eternity in our lives, through our lives. So Father God, we, we want to say afresh to you this morning, we ask you to help us to be people who genuinely number our days, that each day, each context, each situation counts for you. That we can be people who are tools in your hands. Our hands can be doing your work, you working through us, making differences that last for eternity. Father God, help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.